All right, you ready to jump in, team? Chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 5, verse 1, therefore. Whenever you see a therefore in the scripture, you got to ask what it's therefore. therefore. That's an old church joke. If you're an old churchy, you know that one. When you see a therefore, you have to ask what it's there for. This is what it's there for. The first four ch chapters of this book are about your justification in Christ Jesus. It's about that you're not saved based upon your works. You've failed miserably. Natural law. Oh, by the way, Jews, even though you've been trying to practice the Judaic law and God gave it to you through Moses, you fail too. Nobody is justified by their works. Justification, it's only by the blood. That's it. From beginning to the end, you will never, ever, ever be justified by your works. You will be justified by the blood. Justification by faith brings you into the family of God. It opens the doorway. It allows you access. You get to enter. You get to be transformed. You get to be a son or daughter of God in the kingdom of heaven. You get granted eternal life. Chapters 1 through 4. And then he says, there for Therefore, changes, and now we move on, chapters 5, 6, 7, 8. So in the next four chapters are about sanctification. The first four chapters, 1, 2, 3, 4, are about justification. The next four are about sanctification. The book hinges right here and begins another position. Listen, we've been talking about this. Paul's got these two disparate groups, and the Jews believe this, and the Gentiles believe this. And Paul says, hey, I'm squaring things away. This is how you're justified. Now, once you're justified, now come to this process. Join the family. Be on the team. Engage your actions. It's going to get so granular by the time we get to chapter 13, he's going to be talking about how you even behave with your local government. First, we start with justification. <laughs> you're going to a bad church if first you're starting with government. Now, we get to government around here. We're not afraid to talk about government. Can I get an amen? Amen. But we don't start there. We start with Jesus at the center of it all. Jesus is the hub of the wheel. There are spokes that touch every other part of society and family and sexuality and identity and money. There's nothing off the table in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is at the center. His kingdom touches everything and informs everything. It starts with justification. That's step one. Step two, it moves towards now acting in accordance with the way of God. Okay? Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a lot of commentary. I spent a lot of time reading on this, but I want to, I want to look at a very simple principle from this verse. When we're in sin, we're outside of peace with God, and when we're covered by his forgiveness and grace, we're inside of the peace of God, okay? Let's take a quick look at Psalm 32. David is talking about committing massive sin, and this is his song out of that instance. Psalm 32, 2. Blessed is the man whose iniquity the Lord does not count against him, in whose spirit there is no deceit. This is prophetic language. This is talking about the new covenant. This is talking about somebody who the Lord doesn't count their sin against. This is incredible. And David is singing this in the context of killing somebody and having sex with the guy's wife. This is like wild stuff. This is, sounds heretical. That he can be in this relationship with God where there can be forgiveness and grace and mercy and his sin is no longer counted against him. This is crazy stuff. I was talking to um, one of our church members about a, a guy named General Butt Naked. Have you heard, has anybody heard of General Butt Naked before? Let's do the opposite. Who hasn't heard of this guy? Okay, most of you, right, because you're normal people and you don't, yeah. <laughs> General Butt Naked is a warlord in Africa, and he um, would steal kids from their parents' um, villages, and he would give them methamphetamine, and he would put them in front of television and make them watch Rambo and Rocky and, and all of the 80s 
action killer movies, and he would take them back, drugged up, hopped up on meth to their families and say, your parents are those bad guys, now shoot them. And the kids would murder their own families. And I'm talking six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds. Horrific level stuff, like horrific. Um, and that still happens today uh, in different places in Eastern Africa, but it was happening a lot in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s, and there was a guy that was leading this. They gave themselves insane names, just ridiculous names that in their methed up minds watching 80s flicks, they thought they would scare their enemies. And the idea was, I'm, I'll, I'll kill you even naked, and that's how tough I am, and that's why he called himself this. Um, and he a bit was stealing kids. I mean, he had one of the largest gangs of child soldiers uh, in Eastern Africa. And one day he was saying, I'm, you know, talking to himself, I'm, uh, I, I'm the master of the world, I'll kill everybody. And he said he's heard a, a, this voice, well, the voice of God, say, no, you're not. And he was, all of a sudden the fear of God came over him. He was terrified that God was just about to kill him, which, you know, rightly so, God... Um, and he repented and gave his life to the Lord. And then he's, he spent the last 20 or 30 years, got a church, ministries, all kinds of insane stuff. Now, I mean, he's one of hundreds of warlords uh, that do this kind of stuff. His story specifically is the salvation of God. We were in this small group, and I remember uh, one of our men, when we first started the church, he, he was a brand new saved guy. And he just said, I can't believe that God would forgive someone like that. That's not right. It's not right for God to forgive someone that steals kids from their parents' house and has them murder their own parents. Like, there's got to be some kind of place where we say, that's enough, God. No more forgiveness. And I said to my friend, I said, listen, man, if you were born in a third world country and there was a little boy beaten and whipped with an electrical cord and with sticks and you were hiding under the house, half-starved, and you found drugs, right? You, found, you were empowered, and you opened yourself up to darkness, and you grew up in an environment of insane bloodshed. The only way to even survive would be to fend for yourself. You yourself would be just as dark as the general, or perhaps even darker. Because every human has the potentiality to be that evil or more evil. You see, we, one of the problems that we have is we think we're good. Like that's, what, that's why Paul starts in Romans with this whole thing that's like, okay, here's how we start. You're actually not good. That's the beginning of the story. And that's why we're just, we can't be justified by our actions because you could be like, I'm, you don't know me. I'm super nice all the time. But if God strips everything away from you, what do you become? Apart from him, what do you become? So I love the scripture that says he knows our thoughts from afar and the words we speak before we speak them. Which is why we can pray the Lord's Prayer. Lord, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Because you'll know how much of a moron I'll be if I'm in the wrong situation. I almost beat up an Uber driver on the way to church one day. Like I almost like just body slammed him. And I was like, I'm probably going to get arrested. Nobody can preach. This is long ago, far long ago. I wouldn't do that now. No chance. See, without Christ, we live as enemies of God. In our sin nature, we're enemies of God. That's what makes salvation so incredible. That's what makes what God did for us while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us. That's what makes this so grand. If you're a good person, you don't need salvation. If you're so good and so nice and so amazing, why do you need Jesus? You don't. I would say the primary issue with our society as a New York metro church, not that we're just in New York, we're in Charleston, and we're in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I'm wearing my Tulsa hat, Tulsa team. Where are you guys at? We love you, Tulsa. Um, is that most people in our culture think they're good and they don't need God. Every way is to God because everybody's fine. We have amnesia as a race, we don't forget that in the 40s, we were killing tens of millions of each other, just like five minutes ago. For the history of man, that was five minutes ago. We were killing tens of millions of each other. The communists killed 400 million people. And who are the communists? They were you and me apart from Christ in a different culture. 
I'm not a communist. <laughs> All right, so Psalm 32, David's in this context, and it's, he says this, when I kept silent about my sin... My bones became brittle from my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me, and my strength was drained as in the heat of summer. The, the, the bones are about the very internal structure of your body, your most fundamental structure, the deepest place inside of your body. When you're walking in voluntary sin and you do not repent to God, your bones get brittle. The structure of your faith body begins to break down. How do you fall away from God? Let me just tell you this. Just, I don't want you to get freaked out or weird on me. You're not gonna go, you're not gonna go to hell if you say a curse word and then you crash the car, or the car crashes, the Uber guy crashes because I'm strangling on the way. That's not, the, that's not what we're talking about here. When I kept silent about my sin, when I continued in voluntary transgression, not repenting of my sin, there began to be a structural breakdown that was happening inside of me. Amen, child. Fear of God, sense in the fear of God on that one. <laughs> I broke my wrist when I was 17, and um, I was snowboarding, and it hurt really bad. I went to the doctor. The doctor said, you're fine. The nurse was like, no, you can see the crack right here. You need surgery. And the doctor said, nah, just go home. Um, I didn't heal, and I, I haven't been able to do flat push-ups since I was 17. I'm 42 now, and it's been a while. I was <clears throat> snowboarding last weekend, and... <clears throat> I was in the glades, which is in, in the woods. It's a black diamond. I'm cool. I'm a cool guy. I'm doing the cool guy stuff. And i on this run, and I see in this little shallow, narrow run between trees, there's a little root sticking out. And I'm like, that doesn't belong there. <laughs> and it's coming at me quick because I'm moving down the mountain quick. And I move to, I go... I go from my heel side to my toe side and try to lift, and I'm going to pop myself over this root. And I don't do it in time because... When you hit 42, your body, like your mind's saying do this, and it takes your body a minute to be like, what are we doing exactly, <laughs> you know? And so <laughs> it didn't get there in time. And I hit that route, and all 240 pounds of me, plus going 30 miles an hour, flew forward and all on this wrist, bang. And um, <laughs> my brother-in-law was like, yeah! <laughs> Just like... <laughs> and my kids are like, are you okay, Dad? Because Leon and Sally were there. And when I get hurt and anybody says, are you okay? I get mad. Why? Because there's something wrong with me. That's why. Like, they're trying to be empathetic. I'm just like, don't ask me that. Don't ask me that. <laughs> and uh, my, my, my wrist kind of ballooned by that night. And it was just, it, it swelled up. And that was last. And it took three, four days to get to go down, and even this morning as I'm looking over my message notes, yesterday when I was reviewing, like doing message stuff, I would just have shooting pain through my bones. I'm not even doing stuff, just sitting there. And I just think it's such a wild phrase, this, your bones grow brittle inside of you, because when you break a bone, the pain is real and it lasts a while. And it's very deep, and it's very significant, it's very substantial. David doesn't say like, you know, when uh, I was sinning massively before you, Lord, it was like hitting a light headache. He's saying, it's like my actual bones were wasting away. The very essence of who my body is began to waste away by sin. Now, um, our daughter Goldie is six and she's beautiful and I always want to just squish her back down to about three or four because it hurts your heart as a dad when your kids get older. And Goldie's been wearing blush on her cheeks. She doesn't have it worked out, so it's very, very red. It's Santa Claus level, you know, red cheeks, just massive blush on her cheeks. And uh, I look at her, I say, oh my gosh, you look so beautiful, Goldie. You look so beautiful. And in my head, I'm like, she needs a lesson or something to figure out this blush thing. But as a dad, I just say, you look so beautiful, honey. That's what dads are supposed to do. Amen? Uh, so she's, she has a problem brushing her teeth in the standard kind of time frame of toothbrushing. So normally, as a parent, you try to get your kids to like two minutes of brushing. That's, that's kind of the goal, two minutes. You go 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 30 seconds. That's how it works. And she is in the bathroom for 
20 minutes. And she's no way she's doing a minute of tooth. That's not happening. She's in the drawer. She's pulling out the nail polish. There's all kinds of stuff everywhere. She's checking out her bath bombs, just smelling them and then putting them back. And it's the end of the day. As a parent, you're kind of getting, you're getting low on patience, you know? It's kind of, it's waned now by the end of the day. And you're just like, come on, hurry it up. And, and so she, standard, takes 20-ish minutes to get ready for bed, from toothbrushing to PJs. And we're trying to curb that as parents. And the boys are up because they're a little bit older, and so she kind of knows that. She's kind of hiding in the shadows, you know, sneaking around. And I want her to rein it in. And so I, I gave her a relatively false threat last night. I was like, if you don't brush your teeth and get your PJs on in 10 minutes, here's the time right here on my watch, I'm going to discipline you. And she just, like a bolt of lightning into the bathroom. She comes out seconds later, and I'm like, probably didn't brush your teeth, but it's fine. And she <laughs> gets your PJs on, three minutes, she's done. Toothbrushed, and I, I don't mean teeth, I mean toothbrushed. <laughs> PJs on, ready for bed. And, but she, as she was brushing her teeth, I was thinking, like, I can't really spank a kid for brushing their teeth too long. It's not like in the dad list of things you do. That's not on the list, you know? Um, people generally tell us we have good kids. I, I highly recommend J Dr. James Dobson on raising children. If you don't have one or you have kids that like to bite you, get that book and it'll help with biblical principles. Um, they're not secular principles. Secular principles say your kid is your buddy. Let them figure it out. Let them figure out their, their, their style, their sexuality, and you know, how they want to behave. Uh, you know, that's evil. That's from hell. Like, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's so clear and easy to see these days, right? Let your kid just figure it out, and then they'll become who they want to be. Like, they'll manifest their, you know, X-Men powers will come to the light one day. And um, no, that's going really poorly. And we're, we're doing gender mutilation surgery on children as a culture. We're doing horrific things that couldn't have even been imagined 20 years ago. We're castrating little children. It's insane. It's like kind of go to war level insane. Even though I said we're not, we don't have a militia, I reaffirm that point right now. It's that insane. This whole, you know, they can raise themselves. No, your job is to raise them in the way of the Lord. We've been reading the Bible at, at um, dinner as a family and going through the scripture. And I didn't do that. I didn't have that growing up, so I just didn't do it. We didn't do that kind of stuff. We didn't really talk about Christian Bible. -y. We didn't talk about the Bible in our home context. Uh, um, my parents are awesome, but it was just not a practice we had. And it's, I've been applying it because it's my job to raise my children in Christ. It's not my pastor's job. It's not the youth pastor's job. It's not McKenna and child care's job. Thank you, McKenna, for serving. Great hat this morning. It is your job to raise your children in righteousness, and God will judge you if you abdicate that role. Another softball from your pastor this morning. What's my point? My point was I was giving a false threat to Goldie. Um, because I give false threats. It's an Italian thing. If you get around an Italian family, they're always like, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to murder you. I'm going to cu cut your tonsils out. I'm going to chop your feet off if you don't do it fast enough. And then you're like, all right, really? Are you really going to chop my feet off? Is that going to actually happen? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. God doesn't give false threats. And um, when we walk in consistent sin, it gets very dangerous for the believer and God gives a threat to the believer about it. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Now, I always have to give this context. Revelation, Jesus is talking. He's talking to the church. He's not talking to the secular world. He is not talking to unbelievers. He's talking to the church. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold fast and repent. And this is the incredible beauty. Once you're justified and in, your, in the kingdom, there's a way you're called to walk. You can always repent in a moment, in a single moment. God, forgive me, that was idiotic. That's super healthy. When you're a young Christian, you're afraid to say, forgive me again. You're, oh, there's something like, I'm embarrassed. I don't want to say, God, will you forgive me again? A mature, one of the markers of maturity is how fast you run back to the Father when you have sinned. 
But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. This is the, this is the threat that God gives. The one who is victorious um, will be dressed in white. And I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life. So God is saying to the other people in Sardis, if you don't walk the way I've called you, you're not justified by your works, but you're responding to me in love. And if you consistently walk in a voluntary state of soiled garments, I will blot your name out from the Lamb's book of life. Now, blotting means it was placed in there. The whole world is not put in the Lamb's book of life. Only those who believe in Jesus and call upon him as Lord and Savior. Their names are written, active tense, in the Lamb's book of life. And they're called to walk with him in beauty and righteousness. You've been justified. Now step into the kingdom and walk with me. This is not about your perfection. This is not about your obeying every jot and tittle of the law. This is about walking with God. Amen? So then David says this, I acknowledge my sin to you and did not hide my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgression to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. And then we get to live in this peace that's been prepared for us, positional peace before the Lord. It's prophesied about in Isaiah 32, 17, the fruit that the righteous have will be peace. Its effect will be quietness and confidence forever. My people will live in peaceful dwelling places, in secure homes, in undisturbed places of rest. We have the most anxiety-ridden, drugged culture that's ever existed on the face of, the man, of, ma- of man, on the face of the earth. Why? Why are we so anxious? Why are we so full of worry and pain and sorrow? Is it because we are living voluntarily in transgression before the Lord? And here's the other thing. Sometimes we say, okay, God, I'm not anymore. I'm walking clear before you, but I still have this massive pain in my soul. I don't know where. And I want to tell you, it's probably an indicator light from God that there's unforgiveness inside of your heart that we walk in bitterness and unforgiveness and judgment towards others, and we've made commitments. Maybe you were sexually abused as a child, and you came to Jesus, and you said, God, I'm so thankful for your forgiveness, but I also want that person to die. Understandable. Understandable that my friend said in the men's men's, uh, thing, that guy should go to hell. He's stealing children from their parents and making them shoot them understandable, but you don't understand the amount of grace and mercy we've been given demands, requires that kind of response from us toward everyone in our life. Every pain that's ever come, every crossword that's ever been said. And I've practiced this for a long time. And one of the ways I do it is I say, God, like Somebody will pop up in my mind, it's a bad thought. God, I forgive that person, I release them, and then I ask for their blessing. And then I start praying for the blessing of that person. God, I want you to bless their family. God, I want you to bless their finances. God, I want you to draw them closer to you. God, I want you to, to open their eyes to the kingdom of heaven. I had a guy that was here a couple of weeks ago who um, was waiting for me out on the sidewalk. He said, I'm a heretic and false teacher and God, I'm leading people of God away from the Lord, da, 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 da. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I must be bad at it because <laughs> um, I'm not like, I'm not flying in jets with like, like iced, an iced grill or anything. I, I, I wish I... <laughs> and I was frustrated at this guy because my body slamming nature comes in, come to play. And I have to, and I was like actually upset for a couple of hours, and then I was like, oh, right, yeah. Forgiveness, releasing blessing. And then I started praying for the guy, and I'm like, God, forgive this guy. I want you to forgive him for everything he said to me, everything he said about our church on the sidewalk after Sunday. Forgive him and bless him. Bless his finances. He's all alone. I found his YouTube channel. It's got two views per video. You know, he's, he's lonely and miserable. He's probably got some kind of mental... Heal him, God. Bless him, God. Forgive him, Lord. Bring him to a family of God. Bring him to heaven. 
That's what Christians do. And then guess what happens to me automatically? All that tension, all that David Englehart, Rambo, 1980s watching stuff dissipates. It goes away. I'm not my defender. God's my defender. Amen, church? And this is this kind of assurance of peace that we have in Christ. And oftentimes Christians come into Christianity, they get saved, and they say, I have no peace in Christ. And the question is, are you walking in voluntary sin? If not, are you walking in unknown sin, judgment, unforgiveness? One of the great things about the Alcoholics Anonymous program that was built by uh, Christians initially is uh, one of the initial steps is to inventory your life and see if you have any unforgiveness any pain or damage that's happened in your life as a child, as a whatever, release forgiveness. Oftentimes they'll go back and they'll do the forgiveness stuff in person. Church, can I just remind you, if you're walking in pain, you don't know where it's, where it's coming from. I just give you, I want to task you this week, take time with the Holy Spirit, pray, say, God, is there any areas of unforgiveness inside of me? Is there anybody I'm mad at? Is there anyone I hope they don't walk down the sidewalk when I'm walking down the sidewalk? I'll hide. I'll go down and hide. Not just because I'm an awkward human. There's that as well. But because I don't like them. That person needs to be forgived. You need to pray for their blessing and release God's goodness all over their life. Good church? Um, verse 2, though through whom, Jesus, we have gained access by faith into this grace which we now stand and we boast in the hope and glory of God. So Paul's saying that we have now, we're now walking into this doorway. This is what we talked about. This is therefore, we're justified now that we've, now we've gained access into the presence and plan of God. And there's two senses of this word here. I think we need to understand them both. One is the static sense of God's kingdom coming, we're serving it, and the other sense of he has a specific call for your life. Uh, for me, I used to preach all the time about God's call for your life. It, I found that it made people excited and happy, and um, it was never you know, awkward or uncomfortable. It's always fun. If you're preaching about how great people are going to be, it's going to be a great message. Everybody's going to come up to you and say, wow, that was so great. Thank you so much for telling me how great I'm going to be. Like, of course. And I think the church has overemphasized that. Uh, and because there's two senses. You, God does have a specific plan for your life, but that plan is integrated into the kingdom of heaven being established first. It's not for you. It's for God's kingdom to come and the redemption of the world. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth as, is, as it is in heaven. So we have to understand both the static and the active sense of this new life. Uh, Paul goes on to say that we get to boast in two things, in the hope of God and the glory of God. There's hope for our lives here. There's hope for our lives in eternity. There's the glory of God here that the power of the Holy Spirit would work through us, walk with us. Well, we would see amazing things, healing, deliverance, da-da-da. That would be a part of the, of the life of the believer, but there would also be an eternal glory. I was thinking about Zoolander. You remember the first Zoolander where he's walking down the thing and he's got to kill the prime minister? And they're like, he's, they're like don't get distracted by the male model, the other models on the runway. And um, there's this guy from Limp Bizkit who's like this. For those of us who are 40 or over. <laughs> um, I find that Christians can get distracted by one side of the aisle or the other. Like, God doesn't have a plan for me. I'm just going to be good until I get to heaven. And the other side of the aisle, that the plan is all about me, and it's not about me submitting my life to God's plan. Now, let me just tell you this. The church is the primary application for the plan of God on the earth. That's how it goes. That's what he's ordained. Okay. And then verse 3, it says this, not only so do we glory in the hope of God for here and the hereafter, not only do we glory, are we excited about what he has for us in this new kingdom, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that when we suffer, it produces perseverance, perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. Second Corinthians 12, Paul talks to the church in Corinthians about the thorn in the flesh. It's a very famous verse. People speculate about what that thorn is. Some, th some people think it's like a physical ailment, some kind of disease that he has. Uh, some people think it's just all the times he got beaten and scourged, and it's just the tribulation of getting his head smashed in over and over again. We don't know exactly what the thorn in the flesh is, but um, Paul says this about it. He said, to keep me from being conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. It's pretty crazy that God would give us something
to protect our eternal salvation. Something painful. That's a wild idea. It's a very wild idea. It says this in verse 8, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest on me. So Paul, when something bad happens, he doesn't just assume, well, this is God's will for me. Suffering is great. We're just going to suffer all the time. Suffering. My thing is suffering. That's my thing. Like, okay, enjoy that. Like, enjoy that. Go eat your gravel rice or whatever you want to do. Suffering, fantastic. Uh, Paul actually, his first response, he says, I, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. I think the default response of the believer is to believe that God will miraculously deliver you from whatever it is, whether it's sickness or poverty or depression or whatever it is, that God's so good and so powerful that he can actually deliver you. That should be your default position. And if you're, you've pursued it and it hasn't happened, this is what you say. God, your grace is sufficient for me. God, I, I, you know I've been wanting to get married, and you know I've been, you know, seeking you about it, and I live in New York City with all these COVID rats that have venereal diseases, and I'm not, you know, what's going on here? I watched a thing on COVID rats on my way here this morning. And it's hard to find a spouse, Lord, and I've prayed for it, but until you bring it, your grace is sufficient for me. Whatever the issue is, God, your grace is sufficient for me. That your power would be made manifest through me. Not that I would go through it and be ashamed and be sad and be a depressed Christian. And all I do is I'm angry at the world. I'm waiting for Jesus to come back in five minutes. I just listen to John MacArthur all the time talk about suffering. God bless John MacArthur. Lord, forgive him. We release blessing over him. <laughs> um, Paul's talking about you're stepping into this kingdom. There's adventure and there's suffering. But don't worry, even when there's suffering, you will not be put to shame. And this is what the next verse say. And our hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Worship team, you can come up. Chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8, we're going from justification into sanctification, the walking life of the believer. The walking life of the believer is not the beginning of those four chapters because you're not justified by your walking. But once you're in the family, do some dishes, bro. Carry out the trash. Be a part of the family. Be a servant of God. Love Jesus. You know? Don't smoke cigarettes at the, at the dinner table. Begin to walk with God. We're talking about this translation between being enemies of God positionally and entering this incredible kingdom of God by the grace and mercy, by the sacrifice of Jesus, because we had to be sacrificed for and now we enter into this journey that we say, God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Show me what to do. Deliver me from sin. I turn my heart toward you and your kingdom purposes. I, hope in your, and I, I have hope in glory now. I have hope in glory in the future. I have hope for my now. I have hope for the future. I know this is not going to be without suffering. It's part of the game. But God, take me on this adventure with you. I don't want to be a guy that shows up and is just fed and goes home and says, well, I hope this eternity thing works out. I want to walk with Jesus. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the promise to sons and daughters that's full of joy and peace and life and goodness. Lord, we're grateful for Jesus and the sacrifice he made for us. God, kidnap us from our own plans and bring us on the journey. Deliver us from unrighteousness that we would walk in the peaceable fruit of 
of righteousness. We love you, Jesus. And everybody said amen. Stand up with me, church.